So hi, my name is Irv Lustig um, from Princeton Consultants, and today I'm privileged to interview George Nemhauser, who is currently a distinguished professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology. So thank you, George, for joining us today, and uh, let's get started. Oh, you're most welcome. I'm really looking forward to it. All right. So what, tell me, when did you first learn about operations research? Okay. So, you know, basically I'm a chemical engineer, and at the... I think it was the summer between when I graduated a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and the fall when I was going to go off to graduate school at Northwestern for chemical engineering. I had a, uh, I had a job with the research department of Allied Chemical and there was a guy, I think he was my supervisor who was working there, who, who told me he was taking part-time degree at Princeton and he was studying things like linear programming and game theory. And I think maybe Kuhn, Tucker, I don't know. And he told me about this kind of stuff. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting stuff, much more interesting than what I'm doing in chemical engineering. So when I got to Northwestern, I uh, had, as a, mass, as a first year graduate student in chemical engineering, I had one elective course. And I looked and there was this new course called Operations Research. And it says something about linear programming, game theory, and stuff like that. I said, that's it. That's the course I'm going to take. And so then you were able to switch out from the chemi program to a different program? No. So I took that in my first year. I stayed with the chemical engineering. And I got a master's degree. But, you know, I was hooked. And uh, by the most wonderful professor who's had the most incredible effect upon my life. His name was Jack Mitten. And Jack taught that course in, in, in operations research. And pretty much by in the end of the first semester of first year, I had somewhat made up my mind that I was going to switch to what was then a very small industrial engineering program, really just started. Abe Charns was there as well. Mm -hmm. And I made up my mind to switch. I came home for Christmas vacation and told my parents and they're not very educated people at all. And they thought, oh my God, you know, a chemical engineer, a chemical engineer can get a job. What is somebody doing this new crazy stuff that has something to do with decisions and computers seems vague. They, they were really upset about the fact that I might switch. And I talked to a couple of other people. I was also taking a course in electrical engineering and control theory. And this professor of control theory, he told me, he said, you know, if you want to switch out of, out of chemical engineering, switch to electrical engineering, do something solid like control theory, but industrial engineering, it's the lowest form of, I mean, I mean this is what this professor actually told me, this is the lowest form of, of engineering, hardly engineering, you know, um, and, but, but because of Mitten, I did it anyway. And it was one of the best decisions I've, I've ever made in, in, in my life. It, it's funny because, can I just take a, a, a Go second? For, I'm giving the graduation. Georgia Tech has separate graduations for undergraduates because it's big enough and, and graduate students. And so I'm the commencement speaker for the uh, graduate student graduation in December. And I'm right now drafting my 10 to 12 minute speech. And you know, it's, I've never done anything like this before and it scares the hell out of me. But, but I have started writing this and I thought, okay, what I'm going to start with is I'm supposed to give advice to these graduates, right? And I'm going to start with saying, be very careful about what advice you listen to because a lot of the advice that I got turned out to be, I think, pretty bad advice <laughs> and uh, did exactly the opposite and it's been, you know, paid off very well. But you were getting advice then from Jack Mitten who was saying, Yeah, yeah Jack was good. Yeah, yeah, no, Jack was so, you know, low key. I mean, he said, you got to decide what you want to do. You know, I, you know, I just said, I'm with you. And, and so, yeah, yeah. So now, he, and he ended up being your PhD advisor. He was my PhD advisor. And so what was And your, he's a chemical engineer too, by the way. Oh, really? He, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. And then, so what is your PhD thesis? What was that about? Optimization in the chemical industry. And mainly, mainly what I did was, you know, dynamic programming. Typically, when you think of it, it's this multi-stage stuff, but most of the early work was multi-stage in time, right? Time periods of the stages, the natural thing. Well, think of a chemical plant. Chemical plant, multi-stage. 
And, and, but the key thing I had to do was, um, uh, you know, in a standard time thing, time just flows forward. In the chemical plant, you, say, you have stuff going from one piece of equipment to another, continuing and then recycling back. So I had to figure out how to do dynamic programming where, where in today's terms, you have a graph, which is not just a path, but can have cycles and, and so on and so forth, thinking of the stages as the nodes of the graphs and the arcs as the transition points between the graphs. Now you mentioned earlier about- And that stuff all got published in chemical engineering journals. So, so you mentioned earlier about that you, when you came home and your parents were like, what do you mean you're going away from chemical engineering? Right. So can you tell us something, some stuff about growing up and what influences you had being young and what led you down this path? Uh, not, not, not much. Uh, I, I was not a serious student uh, pretty much through, certainly through high school. I went to a great high school. I went to the Bronx High School of Science, which at the time was really a good place. I was not by any means one of the best students there. I did, for example, I had one math professor, teacher there who was a PhD, and he became a very inf interesting person in that he was caught up very much in the McCarthy hearings and eventually was fired from his job as a teacher at Bronx High School of Science. He was the best teacher I've ever had in high school, <laughs> to show you how bad that time was. He, he influenced me a little bit, but I, I just was not serious enough to be a good student. I, I, you know, in college it was easy to get good grades, but, but beyond that I didn't, I didn't give a damn until I found operations research. Oh wow, okay. Yeah. Um, so you talked about your topic and uh, your PhD being about dynamic programming in a chemical engineering framework. How would you say that start influenced your career as things evolved? Um, you know, well, I mean, already that was the start for me in optimization. And I began to explore, you know, other avenues of optimization. And here's something interesting, because I think in a note that I got from Mark, Sid Hess is being interviewed here. I should stop by and say hello to Sid Hess, because Sid Hess was the person who got me started with integer programming. Um, you know, I, I, I had not been looking much, I, I knew of its existence, you know, I knew about, a little bit about teaching it, but I wasn't really exploring it. Sid Hess came to Hopkins sometime in the mid-60s, and uh, he then, he's a chemical engineer, and, and he was working, I, I'm pretty sure he's a chemical engineer, and he was working for some chemical company, I think in New Jersey, but there was a school districting problem where he lived. And he, he volunteered to help with this redistricting process for this non, rather non-political districting problem. I mean, so many of them are so politically driven. And Sid came to Hopkins to give a seminar, and he talked about this districting problem. And they actually had some funding from, I think, the Ford Foundation to do this kind of work. And, and so I, I talked with Sid and I said, you know, this is something that I might like to really work on as a serious research problem. And he agreed and actually provided some funding. And I had a student then by the name of uh, Rob Garfinkel. And, uh, and Rob and I started working on what is a set partitioning problem, my number one integer programming uh, application and attempt at doing algorithms. And from there, you know, now, if you talk, talk about a, a, a practical problem such as the redistricting problem, and there's others that I know you've worked on as well, back then in the 60s, our computational facilities were nowhere near where they yeah. are today. Yeah. So what were the methods that you used to actually provide practical yeah. solutions? And, and so, in fact, with that political districting problem, you know, we, we, could, we could deal pretty much with, by today's standards, incredibly small problems. But but Garfinkel was a programmer before he, before he started graduate school. After undergraduate, he worked as a programmer for a few years. He was an unbelievable programmer. And, and so he did all this, this you know, I, 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 he, he wrote a machine language um, um, program, I think, for, you know, I mean, for being able to do partitioning in this, you know, which made it possible to do much bigger problems. And what we did was an implicit enumeration, non-linear programming based implicit enumeration, almost like constraint programming. Really? We didn't know okay. about constraint programming. And 
Remember, Ballas had an implicit enumeration algorithm, mm -hmm. I think, in the early 70s. This preceded, I see. This preceded that. Um, so you mentioned the collaboration w with Sid Hess. You mentioned uh, Jack Mitten. Are there other uh, people in OR from that time that had influences in shaping your career? Yeah, I, I would say the main person, aside from, from those, um, I mean, with Sid Hess, it was just a, you know a small thing. I mean, it happened. It was great, you know, but I, I didn't really associate it with him that much. But the person, the, the next person who had an unbelievable influence <laughs> on me, was Ray Fulkerson, and so uh, I came to Cornell in the f uh, fall of 1970. I believe that Ray came. Mark might even know. Ray came in the fall of 72 or 73. And um, I mean, I, I'm more or less an engineer. Ray was a mathematician, and 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 Ray was just very much a class act in everything he did. And uh, he gave me a new perspective on on on, on what operations research was. Um, and so I began at that point in my career to look more at some theoretical problems and, uh, and algorithmic problems from more from a, uh, more from a theoretical point of view. And, uh, and so Ray's influence fr from a scholarly point of view on me was, was very substantial uh, and, and I think lasted for, you know, for my whole career after that. So when I looked at uh, prior to our uh, interview today, I looked at your Georgia Tech website and it showed that you've authored or and or co-edited seven books. And as of 10 years ago, I guess you have some updates to do, you had authored and co-authored over 175 papers. Is that right? And I'm sure it's much more than that, given that was a, the last one on there was 2005. And I oh, know wow, you've been is, writing. Yeah. Uh -huh, yeah. So you'll have to go back and get some updates done. But what would you say are some of the major themes that you've had in your career? I mean, we've, I saw works in dynamic programming, integer programming. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, how, how do you view it yeah. at this point? Well, there's no doubt in, in my mind that, that the two integer programming books, first one with Garfinkel, um, and, but the really big one with Lawrence Wolsey in 1988 was, was, really, uh, was, was really what I consider to be main accomplishment. I mean, that book is is still selling quite a few copies. It's it's surprising, you know, for a technical book like that. Although you, if you went to the uh, awards uh, thing last night, you'd see that uh, that Corny Joe's Conforti, Corny Joe's, and Zambelli have uh, they have a new book out there. It's it's a very very good book, but it's it, it's it's less approachable as a textbook than 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 the, than the book with Lawrence. And of course, Girard is um, my PhD student uh, from Cornell. And he, research-wise, research is the best PhD student I've ever had. Nobody's close. Um, I mean, he's amazing. He's won all these you know, right. awards, too. Uh, and he now, uh, in, in, what was it, in, in late 70s, when Sherrod was a PhD student, on the, Marshall Fisher was visiting Cornell at the time, and Marshall came with a nice problem, and we worked together with it, and Gerard was involved too, and this had to do with, with float in terms of uh, bank transfers and so on, and, and we did win a Lanchester Prize for that paper as well. So now Gerard has two Lanchester Prizes, so, and, and so there are now three people with two Lanchesters, uh, Lex Griver as well. As well. So, uh, um, so I didn't answer your question, by the way. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, well yeah. So I, what we're looking at, I mean, we know about the work that you've done in integer programming and the books, but if and um, you know, you and you talked about, I guess, how uh, Fulkerson really introduced yeah, you into yeah. integer programming and got you into it when you got to Cornell. Um, are there pr particular things that you've seen that you feel like over your career, aside from the books, that were results that you're particularly proud of. Sure. Um, um, 
first of all, the thing I'm most proud of, of all is not all the papers, it's all the PhD students. And, and, and so, I th I, I'm going to venture to guess, and I could be wrong about this because I have no proof, but I'm going to venture to guess that I have graduated more PhD students than anyone else in operations research. Now that's a big claim, that's right? Big claim. Well, it's, it's, well, we can, you know, there's the mathematical geolo geolo yeah, geology project yeah, yeah. that can actually prove it. Right, right. It's, it's, it's so, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's not up to date at all, but I, I, I'm just making a guess that, that, uh, that that's, that's the case. Um, I, I check with a few other people and who might, um, by the way, I'm not going to hold this for long. Demetrius Bertsimus is amazing. He now at MIT, he, he, he already has about 50 PhD graduates. I'm around close to 70. Mm -hmm. uh, Demetrius is now supervising 18 PhD students. At one time. At one time. Oh I don't know how he does <laughs> it. Yes. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and, and so the thing, the thing that I'm really most proud of at all is, is all these students that, that, that I have graduated and some of them who, you know, who not just Gerard, but so many others who've, 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 who've really been so successful. At, uh, at a keynote here is being given by Alper Adam Turk, Berkeley. He was one of my Georgia Tech students. In, in moving from Cornell to Georgia Tech, the thing that I worried about most and whether that transition was going to be something that I was going to be happy with was the whole issue of could I get the same quality PhD students that, that Cornell was getting at Georgia Tech. It took a, it took a little while, but, but uh, it, it, it clicked after a while. In terms of, in terms of applied work, uh, uh, but not really applied work so much, but motivated by applied work. Or the thing that I like is that, and I try to tell this to my students, I don't try to work on the problem that somebody writes a paper and says, here's the part I haven't quite, you know, here's the open problem, because they probably have such a heads up on it. Anybody in doing that, that's not the thing to do. I like to find the qu my questions from the applications. So part of my motivation for doing applications is I'll learn about what exactly, you know, is needed it, 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 in the field, and then can go off and, you know, maybe get funding from NSF or, or something like that to, to, to work on on that kind of stuff. So the big one for me in that regard is, 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 is branch and price. And so the, that, by the way, is, is my most cited, uh, uh, of all my papers, the most cited one is, is, is the branch and price paper. It's joint with, with Ellis Johnson, Cindy Barnhart, and Martin Salvesberg, mm -hmm. and maybe one other person, but one, one of my other students, Pam Vance, maybe. Uh, Martin was, was my postdoc right. at, at, at Georgia Tech. Cindy was an assistant professor, but I regarded her as a postdoc student, too. <laughs> she's chancellor of MIT now, you know. I mean, she's amazing. Yeah. She's an amazing woman. But, and we just had dinner uh, together at the National Academy of Engineering meeting a couple of weeks ago. Cindy is. Just, just, just great. And those are the kinds of you know, working with younger people like that. And but also, let me say that working with Ellis Johnson was was amazing. Um, it, Ellis is it, when you probably ask for one person who's done more in both theory and applications together. I would vote for Ellis. Working with Ellis at Georgia Tech was was a great thing, and we were a good team together. And 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 you know the Branch and Price stuff came f partly from all the work we were doing with the airlines. So, so in the late 80s and early 90s, we just did a whole lot of stuff with all, you know, pretty much all the airline problems. That's how we got Cindy involved. Right. Um, and, and so, so I'd say that work, which led to Branch and Price, probably is one of the things I'm most proud of. And, and f fortunately in that case, in which the operations research people don't do a very good job, we picked a good name, right? Branch and Price, that's a cool name, so <laughs> that helps. <laughs> so, so you talked about how a lot of your work has been motivated by applications. Um, so can you describe some of the applications that you've been involved in? Sure. I mean, well, here's the one that's the most fun for me. You know, uh, Mike Trick and I have a, a small company 
that does sports scheduling. Right. And you know about that yes, well because you're in that business too. That's right. And 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 so uh, the sports scheduling work, which had a had a fun start to it. Um, you know, so many of these things come about fortuitously, how you get involved in, in different applications. It, 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 you don't really plan it. I mean, but once you get involved in it, you better learn, you better learn the functional area, to, you know, because you can't just do the application without really understanding the problem. I swear, Ellis, you know, he, he, he sometimes would memorize these, these schedules. And you know, to come, oh yeah, you know, that's got point. We, we, yeah, I think we should move that. Way. I mean, you know, he was amazing. He would just study this stuff. But, but anyway, the sports scheduling started when I, I I had a fun job at Tech, in 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 I was Georgia Tech's faculty representative to the Atlanta Coast Conference and to the NCAA, and and I was at a uh, a meeting of the Atlanta Coast Conference, and the guy who was the assistant or associate commissioner for basketball operations. You know, it was already becoming a big business. Uh, said, you know, in the past I've done this schedule for 20 years. I'd sit down with pen and pencil and I'd write down a schedule and everything would be fine. And now I've got to deal with, with ESPN and CBS and I can't do it anymore. I don't know what to do. You know, if I, I do something that makes ESPN happy. Then the coaches start screaming at me because they've got three or four road games in a row and blah, blah, blah. And I, by that time I was doing the scheduling work with the airlines, and so I said, oh, you know, let me just see if I could, uh, if I could help a bit with this. And I knew that Mike was doing some baseball stuff already. Right. And, so, and Mike, you know, is a, is a Georgia Tech PhD. But I taught energy programming for several years at, 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 at Cornell, and I'd have a reasonable group of graduate students. Uh, I just taught energy programming from a pretty full set of notes for, with a book with Lawrence. And uh, I started that class with, with three students, and I think two assistant professors, John Vandebate and Craig Tovey, sat in. But there's only three students. And by the end of the first semester, there was only one left, and that was Mike Trick. <laughs> they didn't have the students then. We do now. Right. And, 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 and so. So the ACC, like we got the, I got the basketball scheduling going. We did some work with Mike, and, and we, we, we did some, we developed some software for, for doing that. And and then it took us years to get the, you know, to beat that couple in, in doing the baseball. Right. But we finally did. We've had that contract now for close to 15 years, I believe. Right. Uh, so actually, that's an inter probably an interesting story because as we are preserving this, you know, now you have been involved in scheduling Major League Baseball. Uh, for for a while, um, tell us what it's like to work, you know, with MLB and and work on the schedule on on an annual basis now. You know, interact. This is a situation where interaction with the client's needs is is absolutely critical, which is I'm sure true in pretty much all applications, except except this is a, these clients, and they could be. It could be Major League Baseball, but it could also be a little conference like the MEAC. Do you know what the MEAC is? MEAC is Middle Eastern Athletic, Athletic conference. conference. Right. The MEAC is 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 the is an African American school conference. It has Howard, Morgan State. It goes all the way down south to Florida A and M, and and we do their scheduling, sort of almost on a pro. It's not pro bono. They pay us a little bit, but they don't have much money, and so we. They contacted me, and I didn't want to tell them no. And 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 the point, is, whether it's MEAC or Major League Baseball, until they look at schedules, they don't really know what they want. And right. and so this creates an incredible iterative process. You could call it you you could call it multi-objective optimization with a hundred objectives, or you know, right. I mean, how do you do? I mean, and so that becomes a tricky thing. But the importance of the objectives only, only evolve as they look at the schedules. And so it's, it's a process that, that can go on and on and on 
you know, there are no convergence theorems other than everybody's tired and the deadline has uh, arrived, <laughs> and, and, and that's the day of convergence. Now, with something like baseball, now you've been doing it for a number of years, is, is it still very iterative in that way as their objectives are changing each year? Baseball is, is, is I think, less iterative because an iteration takes an incredibly long time, <laughs> and, and so, uh, and so that makes baseball, you know, a little bit less. You just can't can't really do it. And and in the case with baseball, I'm not the main person, you know, with the client. So okay. so I, I have I, I don't have such direct information as I do with with, with some, some of the basketball. Others. Okay. Yeah. Um, how when all is said and done, how would you like? To, I guess we've really answered this question. You know, how would you like to be remembered? But it seems to me, I think I can answer it for you. It sounds like it's your PhD students. Yeah, that's first. That's first. <laughs> um, uh, I know you served on a number of uh, as in a number of leadership positions, both within Informs and the Math Programming Society. Um, can you tell us about your roles in those society and how you how you've seen those different organizations evolve? I mean, Informs has you know made amazing changes since 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 I was. Uh, uh, president of Orsa, uh, it's grown so much. It's 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 a much more sophisticated professional society. I I think it's it, I think it's done very well. It still is not integrated as much as I would like to see academics and and business people. There still is is a gap there, and, and I saw it um, in the you know the felt the new fellows were announced. Last, last night, night right. and it will be the fellows' uh, lunch uh, coming up soon. Um, of the, I believe, eight fellows elected, only two from industry. And if you look over the years, the number of people from industry who are fellows is small. The National Academy of Engineering, on the, on the other hand, you know, we have an operations research section and we're responsible for, for electing new members, we get an allocation each year. They have pushed much, much harder that, that there be industry uh, uh, people chosen for the academy. In fact, this year they've taken it further than they ever have before and said, of your slots, half have to come from industry. Wow. And, and so uh, w w with the Informs Fellows, the, the problem is twofold. One is that not so many nominations occur from people from industry. Maybe they care less. I don't know, but uh, maybe there, there are fewer nominations because there are fewer successes. And so I argued very hard this year, um, that, that, and, and it, w it wasn't so easy. But we need to do more, I think. I still think we need to, if we're going to make this the organization that I would like to see it be, um, then I, I think a better integration and, and is, is, is needed. Not exactly, you know, how we do this. I'm not sure. Maybe there should be some seminars or workshops that that Inform should sponsor with direct goal of of, of connecting industry. It's, a, it's always been, it's been a challenge, I know, for the you know, I guess I'm close to 30 years involved with the society, sure. both as an academic and now as a practitioner, and I've seen it as a continual challenge. Yeah, yeah uh, it that's is. always come from from both sides. Um, where do you see the field going in the future? Well, you know, I mean, it, 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 it's, I don't know what you, you, you know, immediate future. The well, you can think of short-term future, sure. you can think yeah, of yeah, 5, 10, 15, yeah, 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 I'll just think of short-term, because 5, 10, 15 years, I won't, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be out of here one way or another. Um, and, and so, I mean, n now, of course, the issues are, are, are the big data issue, which we're seeing everybody talk about, is, is and, 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 and what we do with it. Um, and, and, and the kind of computing that we can do. I mean, uh, computing power has just grown so enormously. And so I, I think those problems are, 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 are plenty to deal with over the next few years, along with, with I think, our ability to deal with uncertainty is still not very well developed. You know, I think in terms of optimization, our ability to deal with deterministic 
models. You know, there's still, there's some, still some huge problems we can't solve, but, but we've done very, very well. We continue to make great progress with deterministic models. But I still think, but I think on the stochastic side, there, I, I don't see the same progress in the sense that I don't see it adopted by industry in, right. in the same way. And to me, that's the measure. The measure that, you know, the, the one technology that has really been enormously successful that we can say came out of operations research is, is linear and energy programming and some nonlinear programming is the fact that there's commercial software. Right. But when you look at anything else that we associate directly with our field, so I'm, you know, sure we use statistics and all that, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm thinking of the stuff that came directly out of OR, I don't, I, I don't see that commercial software at the same level, which tells me that means that industry has not, not adopted it as, as, as and, and, and why? I still think it's awkward to, to use that stuff, and the results are, 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 are not, you know. You know, it's interesting terrible. you mentioned about uncertainty. When I interviewed George Nansing 14 years ago, yeah. um, George, that was always his thing. I mean, when right, it right. started George in, he was always trying to, from his beginning of his oh, career, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, was. he always cared about uncertainty, and in his interview he said, he says, that's the one thing that I really wish people would get, is, fi is understand that we really have to incorporate sure. uncertainty into our decision yeah. making. And, and we, you know, I mean, stochastic programming has some impact now. I still think it's probably pretty light in terms of real applications. Right, and um, I think the challenge has been um, how we get business people to think and understand uncertainty and represent uncertainty and sure. talk about uncertainty is a challenge. And uh, even in, in this talk I just came from, the plenary, Right. was about you know how we deal with big data and computability and stat statistics all at once. And he says it's a rich thing just to talk about risk. Sure. Uh, how do we think about these things? And I think so yeah. it's, it's been an ongoing challenge. Yeah, I, yeah. And I, I would agree with yeah. you there. I mean, new, new ideas have emerged like robust optimization, which, uh, right. you know, I, but, but some of that is, can be awfully conservative. I argue with Demetrius. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> I've had yeah. debates with him as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, and the, the, the one thing that's gotten really, really hot now is machine learning. Right. Everybody talks about machine learning, machine learning. And, you know, machine learning, the way people talk about it now, clearly has become something I think that's viewed more generally as, say, more important than optimization. Now, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm not putting down machine learning at all. Right. But, and of course, optimization is a tool that's used in machine learning. I mean, the, the machine learning algorithms are driven by optimization. Right. But the overall impact of optimization is so much greater than, than it is in machine learning. But, but it doesn't, it, 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 uh, the computer science people seem to know much better than the OR people how to market what they do. And, and, and I, you know, I don't know why we haven't learned better. What are we missing? I'm not really sure, but, well, but you it's know, there. Well, I think there's the continual efforts that uh, you know, Informs has been doing in terms of analytics and mm -hmm. pushing the different levels sure. of analytics. And, sure. um, you know, there, it's, there is slow movement. You yeah. see now Gartner talking about companies saying, realizing that the next place to go is go from predictive up to prescriptive analytics, which sure. really is optimization. Right. Um, and, and so by the way, you know, I, I find, uh, last night people say, okay, we're into this, before we had operations research and management science, whatever they are, and now we have analytics. And, and I don't understand that statement at all. I mean, uh, didn't we always have analytics? Yeah, we just found a word for it. We found a word for it, yeah. Maybe, at, you know, Unfortunately, in 1940, whatever it was, and we called it analytics rather than operations <laughs> research, we, we might have been a little bit better off now. This is true. Because people understand that word, analytics, yes. you know. So what do you feel is the most valid criticism of operations research in, in your view, and how would you respond to it? You know, I, 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 I just wonder if it should be taken as a, as a criticism. I mean, a, a big part of criticism of academia, oh, we do things that's just really mathematics and has nothing to do with, with what operations research is. Operations research is really an applied science engineering 
But when you look into it, uh, really a lot of the people who are doing very theoretical work, like my colleague Arkady Nemirovsky in nonlinear programming, uh, it may take a little more time for that work to get into practice. Right. So, and, and, and so I don't accept all the criticism that, oh, there's too much theory, you know, the theory is all useless and, and, and stuff like that. But, but, there, but the key thing is trying to, trying to get people to understand that, that, that if you work on applied problems, you get motivation for the important theoretical problems, sometimes somewhat more so than if you, you do by reading the conclusion sections of people's papers. Right. So, so you know, we were talking about earlier, I know you did work, you mentioned the work that you've done with the airlines, we've talked about sports scheduling. Um, how are you finding the next applications to work on? Um, so, for the past, for the past decade, um, I, together in part with Martin Salvesberg and also with uh, Shabir Ahmed, have been working closely with ExxonMobil research, both their, their upstream and downstream groups, once in New Jersey, once in Houston. And, and they are a good company to work with because I find that we're most successful when the organization we work with, this is on research, where the organization we work with has its own PhD people who understand their problems. They're working on the more short-term problems that need to be solved in the next year or two, and they say, oh, also we have the luxury of having some funding to look, to look what we should be doing five years from now or three years mm -hmm. from now. And, and, and so those interactions have been very positive, and we've had great fun working with ExxonMobil on maritime inventory routing. So this is the routing of the big, big ships, which are so expensive. The big, the big tankers. The big tankers, you know, all around the world. Um, you know, Middle East to U.S., China, and all this kind of stuff. And, and so that's been long-term research, and ExxonMobil takes a, takes a pretty long view. And, uh, and, and, and so, uh, you know, we've done some, looked at some stochastic modeling with that, because there is, a, of right. course, a lot of uncertainty in, in, in that business. But, but they allow us a pretty long-term view to, uh, to look at, at, at stuff, we, and, and, and we're just doing the task order now for next year's work, and you gotta guess, it was machine learning is what they want us to start <laughs> looking at, right? And, uh, and, and then you bring that back into the work that your students end up doing. Exactly, I mean, well this is you know, contract work with, it's not consulting mm -hmm. work, it's contract right. work with Georgia Tech, as opposed to baseball, for example, which is, is, is not Georgia Tech, it's, right. it's it's more consulting, co private company work. And, and, and that I find is, is the difference. I find mostly working with, uh, uh, with companies that have, have their own research staff, there you can you know, really do research with industry. But if you're right. working with somebody like a sports conference, uh, they need their schedule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they don't have any interest. That's in, right. In, you know, in fact, in fact, we, Mike and I would have always loved to have tried for an Edelman with the baseball stuff because we think the impact of that work has really been, right. been very significant in terms of what they actually do and, 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 and the revenue in terms of new contracts. Um, but uh, they don't like that idea. <laughs> and so, you have to have know. the client endorsement. Exactly. Um, what do you feel in the field remains to be done that has, well, we talked about this uncertainty as it really is. Yeah, you, yeah you, so George you was right. question before I yeah, asked them. Yeah, so George was right. Yeah, so George yeah. was right. <laughs> um, George to, was always right. Today, when you have uh, a student come in and let's say they haven't picked OR as a field, what would you do to sway them to pursue, to join the OR department versus, say, your old field of chemical engineering? <laughs> Good question. Good question. Well, I mean, for, first place, you know, you got to tell students, now you're into my graduation speech, you got to tell students, hey, you got to find something you love to do, because it's all about passion. You know, if you got passion for something, and, and, and it's something that you can be good at. I mean, I had always had passion for sports, and, and when I was 
when I was 10, uh, I thought I you know, would like to play center field for the Yankees and replace Joe DiMaggio. But, but a couple of years later, I realized I couldn't even do it for my high school because I was so <laughs> untalented. And, and, and uh, so it's a combination of passion and something you can be good at. That's what makes it. So I, 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 don't, I don't try to, you know, I try to encourage students to say, hey, you may like this, come take a course. But, but then it's got, you've got to decide what you want to do, right? And, and so I think the teaching, the teaching part, at least for undergraduates, is, is, is really quite important. Um, we've started now, Cornell used to do this, but for us, it, because we have so many students, it's even bigger. And so we used to teach our, our, our undergraduate, like junior level courses, you know, in linear, in opt first course in optimization, first course in stochastics. Um, we used, to, we used to teach them in sections of 75 to 100, but and, and, and we could have four sections each semester of that size. Wow. I mean, just, just such a big number of students. And so many of those sections were taught by graduate students. Mm -hmm. And so the last thing I've decided to do is, because we have so many bright people in our, on our faculty, like Santino Day, and, uh, uh, who can teach the energy programming course, which I taught for years, I said, I'm gonna go back and really try to do undergraduate. And, and so now I teach over 200 students in the first optimization course, okay. where I do two hours of lecture and then recitations, which is a model, but, but, it's, but it's a very big class. And there, you know, what I try to do is get the students excited by applications. And so, you know, it, if I say sports scheduling, you know, I mean, half of the students, they wake up, you know. <laughs> if I say extreme point, they go to sleep. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, you know how to do it, right? Right. Well, and, and uh, uh, what other applications do you find excite the students beyond the, the sports scheduling ones? You know, most of these students will be excited by almost any any application. It could be a, a financial application. It could be a supply chain, the, the, the Exxon stuff. Right. And, and, and so I think it's important, and, and it sometimes doesn't happen, and it's, it's very important for the undergraduates that they be taught by people who do have some experience, so that, and so you can you, you know, motivate them by, by real problems. Well, of course, when you get to the PhD course in energy programming, those 15 students are paying attention every second. You know, they're watching whether you've got your epsilons and deltas right, and, <laughs> and, and, and so it's a whole different story, and maybe I like the model we're doing now with some of the younger people teaching that stuff because they're better at it than I am. And <laughs> no, that's really interesting. It's that, that, you know, I think we, you talked earlier about how the applications have motivated your work and the different types of things that you've done over your career. And that, in some sense, is a little bit of coming full circle now that teaching undergraduates and getting them to understand the motivation comes from that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I guess I would like to. We'll conclude here. I we've gone through this list of different things that you know. It was amazing how you answer my questions before I even ask them. Um, Your are there questions any, were so good. I mean, there we go. So how? So um, are there any uh, concluding remarks you'd like to give and? From you know perspective of this will be something that'll live on forever to inspire the next generation of students to uh, join the field and do good work. Hmm. I think I'm 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 I'm, I'm, I'm a bit talked out here, <laughs> uh, but uh, a preview of your uh, commencement speech. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it it it. Uh, you, yeah. I think the field is healthy. Um, I, I, I really do. I, I think we went through a period, and it probably was during most of the time that, at least that I was at Cornell, where where the division between between academia, theory, and industry was getting more and more separated, mm -hmm. and 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 there was the question of whether this field would even survive as a as an engineering field because it cannot survive as a as a mathematics field unto itself. That's, that's completely right. obvious. Um, but I, I think enhanced computational power that began to happen in the 80s 
and, and PCs and all this kind of stuff began to make these analytic tools a little bit more accessible to people and things began to come together. And I believe they now will come together more and more and, and, and our field will have greater and greater impact. Where, you know, where it will wind up, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, some people think, well, maybe it should be, like we should have an OR department that's part of a, a, a college of computing. Um, maybe that would make more sense. I'm not sure about that. Um, certainly, certainly we're not, you know, OR being part of mathematics faculty is not a good idea. Right. Um, part of business faculty, I think, I think it, it's diminishing in the business schools, mm -hmm. which worries me. Right. I mean, at least OR. Maybe the simple analytics and stuff like that is, is hot in the business schools, but, but not the, the, more, the more rich and, and complex OR. Is not is not quite there. So so where OR will wind up academically, um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I think it's an important issue, but but I think as an applied science, it's it's well and healthy and 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 will will continue to be so. All right. So thank you, George. I think it was a very enjoyable conversation and uh, appreciate spending the time with you today. Yeah. Well, thank you, Irv. It was good talking to you and and Mark here. And uh, thanks for doing the. Hard technical work, appreciate it. <laughs> okay. <laughs>